to uh, uh, thank Kim first for uh, asking me and certainly everybody at Creative Mornings but um, all of you as well it's uh, it's been really interesting for me to, to sort of see where the Hamilton community grows from and um, when Kim began telling me that there was going to be something of a full house I was I was sort of surprised um, I guess I'm always surprised when, when the house is full, but um, I, I shouldn't have been. And um, so, first of all, I, I would like to thank the city of Chicago. And the, the reason I say that is because when I began as director uh, six years ago, I began the um, idea of running workshops at the museum. And we benefited incredibly from a documentary done by Cartemquin Films called Typeface. Um, and of course, Cartemquin is a uh, Chicago-based company. But anyway, as I began running these workshops, you're sort of curious, where are these people coming from? Now, I was a, a printer in Green Bay for, well, 29 years just with my dad alone. But anyway, the point is, I assumed I could pull people in from Green Bay, certainly Milwaukee, because I knew a lot of people from there as well. Uh, instead, um, what we're getting is people from Chicago. And it, it was very rewarding. Um, after a while, you realize, don't question success, you know. But the point is, Chicago has always been so supportive of the museum, and it, it's... Uh, you know, thanks to those of you who have supported us in all those many ways, either by visiting or obviously um, purchasing things, but coming to the workshops, it's just, it's been great. So um, I'm, I'm sort of impressed and pleased that I get to come and talk in Chicago because Chicago has been so good to us. So, well, um, I've got uh, a lot of slides and I'd like to try and get through them all. Um, Kim has promised to throw an orange at me if I go on too long, so I'll, I'll try to stay on task. Um, so what I'm going to do is try to give you an overview of Hamilton, sort of uh, where it came from and, and where we're moving on to. But uh, 1880 is when this all begins, so James Hamilton um, does not begin because he thinks that this is a great business to get into, but simply because he was asked. So, like a lot of uh, like a lot of things that began and developed very well, it was very inadvertent in the beginning. Uh, so, Hamilton begins making type merely as a favor, and then you know what it's like. You do someone a favor, they ask you to do another one, only in a little bit less time. That's that's how design certainly works. Um, but in any case, the photograph that you're looking here at here is uh, from about 1889, so nine years into it, um, it's a huge crew that's almost uh, predominantly making type or preparing the wood for it. Um, now I'm going to advance to the peak of Hamilton, um, and uh, I went a little too fast there. Um, this is the, the complex that was. So as we speak, um, nearly the very end of this factory is uh, being demolished. Um, a very sad thing, obviously it meant we got kicked out of the building uh, with five months to move to a new place. Uh, more about that later, but the, the thing is, you know, Two Rivers, Wisconsin is something of the middle of nowhere. Um, in 1880 it was even more the middle of nowhere. So. Uh, there were two advantages that Hamilton had though. Geographically, he was in the center of the country. Um, and then um, he also began offering his type at half the price of everyone else's. So kind of a good way to get into the market. Um, 
he was not doing the traditional type, um, and I will explain a bit about that, but he began making other things uh, as a way to continue. So you're looking at a very early specimen book, but you can see the type cases that they made at the time as well. A very common sense approach, right? You sell somebody enough stuff, they got to put it somewhere. So as Hamilton attempted to be the one to be your one-stop shop for your printing needs, um, they began to develop those sort of uh, peripheral things that is what allowed them to grow to be such a, a massive manufacturer. Um, but like all uh, type makers, they put out an annual specimen book and wonderfully designed pieces that uh, just sort of illustrated those kinds of type that uh, Hamilton was offering. So every year, um, as he grew, as he added more typefaces, and as he bought out all of the other major type makers in the United States, um, he suddenly is offering 500 different styles. Um, and obviously they get more elegant uh, and more interesting. It, it's a wonderful thing in that uh, Hamilton accumulates all of his competitors, basically buys the technology, uh, but there, there is a gravity to that which we're truly beginning to feel now because it's one thing to say with pride, Hamilton um, basically eliminated all competition in the United States within 15 years. Um, however, when you consider all of those competitors going out of business, those people are no longer practicing, the equipment is dumped, um, that gravity increases because of the fact that the knowledge of how this is done resides almost exclusively in one little town. So it, it puts us a little more on task to make sure we record it um, as, as well as possible in as many ways. So in, in terms of the process of making wood type, um, it is uh, essentially a, a tracer and router uh, method. Here you get to see James Hamilton standing in one, uh, in front of his pantograph machines and the one in the foreground with that sort of swirling design um, was last used uh, yesterday. Um, so uh, these things still work. They're, they're designed really well, but it also gives you an idea that our intent, um, certainly as a working museum, is to make everything work as well as possible and to sort of bring those things back to life. Now, I was saying earlier that Hamilton um, was merely asked to make type. So not knowing anything about printing, he came up with what we call the veneer method. So he cut pieces of holly on his little scroll saw, threw them on whatever cheap block of wood he could find, and there was your type. It held up extremely well, uh, but it obviously wasn't as durable as what all of his competitors were using. Basically, everybody else was using the router method, and therefore the pantograph was the tool for making type. Um, in the center of this image, you can see die stamped type. Um, that, in a way, is an odd thing to me because it's, in a sense, crushing the wood to depress the area around the image. You would think that the block would basically explode um, or at least splinter, um, and yet they managed to make type that way. Now, um, we are aware of the veneer method, we practice the router method, the die stamp method we have the machine for but no longer anyone to teach us how it's used. So um, we are in the process of actually getting that machine working again too. And uh, of, uh, of all things that it did, the beautifully uh, patterned borders that Hamilton made were uh, the one that they used it the most for. So wood type is made from hard rock maple, and what you're looking at here is end grain uh, maple slabs. Um, the, you can't dry an entire trunk of a tree evenly, so you gotta cut it down to these little half pie, half moon pieces, um, which need to be cured over the course of a year before um, they're, they're dry enough to be made into type. Um, the pantograph operators that began cutting the type, you can see here, I think John Mosler, and the woman on the right in that stunning uh, top, I believe we, we've just identified as Kathy Danks. Um, no idea if she is with us anymore, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, 
but in any case, you do get to see people working at the pantographs that you looked at in the prior picture. Um, Cutting type is uh, a long process. There is not only the cutting of the type, but the, the trimming of the type. So um, when you have a round tracer, it leaves round marks on the type. So you essentially have to go in and hand cut all of the slots. So think of the letter V, M, or N. Um, even the, uh, the counter of the letter A has a triangle in the center. So that has to be basically chiseled out. Um, these guys don't have uh, templates to follow, so this is all basically handwork, and obviously any flaw and the printers will let you know really fast. So within our collection, um, Kim was saying that we have the world's largest collection of type, a million and a half pieces, and no, I have not counted them. You're just gonna have to trust me on that. Um, but within the collection, there's a lot of really great stuff, not just that which Hamilton made, but their predecessors. So essentially the collection, um, uh, we've got a, a lot that I would say is post-Civil War, a very small amount by the sort of godfather of American wood type making, Darius Wells. That's roughly 1830 that our type comes from. Just a few images that I can pass along here. We like to refer to this as the, uh, the pornography of typography. <laughs> uh, some of the earlier pieces in the collection come from, uh, I think, the, uh, the best uh, American type cutter, William Page, in Norwich, Connecticut. What you're looking at here is a chromatic font, um, so a two-color. Page was actually incredibly adept at three-color fonts as well. If you are interested in looking at imagery of that, you don't need to go any further than the Newberry Library. Uh, we're very fortunate that on our artistic board is Paul Gale um, from the Newberry who manages the print collection, but beautiful specimens. Um, so that is a place I, I would strongly encourage you to check out. On, on this uh, Tuscan, you have those wonderful counters. and. Uh, even the letter Y at the bottom, you can see, has these beautiful little heart-shaped counters within it. So there is the, the organized collection. Um, there is the slightly less than organized collection. Um, um, another Chicago co connection is the Globe Printing Company, which um, ended uh, working in letterpress in about 1978. They had 135 massive boxes full of type, which they gave us. Um, it wasn't sorted. So you would open up a box and you would have a two foot piece of type and a three line piece of type, 36 points, um, all mixed together. So, you know, you might be wondering why there are no A's in this set. Well, that's because they are 50 boxes down the line. So we've done a fair job of organizing that, uh, but, you know, there, there is lots to go. Um, and, and that says nothing of the type within our own collection. Because of the way donations came in and the way the museum began, uh, the collection is, is not perfectly organized. What I think is interesting to note here is that it wasn't, the museum wasn't begun uh, 16 years ago because Hamilton said, we need to preserve our legacy. It was much more a case of the local historical society said, two things. Number one, we got to have something to do in this town, and secondly, we cannot allow this legacy to leave two rivers. Um, oddly enough, Hamilton made type until 1985, right? In the typeface film, they joke about the fact that they stopped then because the Mac came out and, well, you didn't need wood type anymore. Um, but the truth is, then they merely moved to the north side of Two Rivers and continued cutting type until 1992 under the heading of HWT, Hamilton Wood Type. Um, so a very late legacy there, but getting back to the origins of the museum, it was the Two Rivers Historical Society. So these people are not museum people, they are not printing people, design typography, they're merely dedicated volunteers. So if somebody came in with type, you would shove it against the wall, and then you would come in with a broken Davidson offset press. They didn't know that was no good to the letterpress community, so you would shove that up against it, and shove 
that CompuGraphic uh, typesetter from the 80s up against that. So a bit of sorting to do, but um, back to the globe for a moment, beyond the um, type that they gave us were 2,000 decorative blocks. Um, based on the clients that Globe had. What we have in there is everything from political advertising, um, circus, fair, rodeo, entertainment. Um, for days I would go through grocery store blocks. It would say peaches or cherries or Crisco or something like that. And then you'd come across a really wonderful photo engraving of an incredibly young Miles Davis. So there, there's some great pieces in there. And then there are also some really weird pieces in there. Um, now, at, at first glance, this is merely a clown who is, uh, I suppose, advertising the circus. Um, when you print this, he seems angry. Clowns have a very weird legacy. The more I learn about them through posters, the weirder they get. Um, uh, now, to begin with, I, I can't really explain the little biohazard symbol earrings that he seems to be wearing. Um, but. Um, the Ferris wheel is in the background, right? So you're advertising the fact that you too can go to the fair and, uh, and ride on the Ferris wheel. So you've got uh, these individuals who are sort of going along in their little buckets, waving their arms, having a wonderful time, except for the group on the far right. They seem to have broken away from their mooring and they are plunging to their death. So <laughs> an odd way to market, you have to admit. Um, so, you know, it, it's very curious when we run across those things. Um, what is uh, more enjoyable is when we run across something like this, hand-carved blocks from the 30s. Now, because it came to us out of order, what I had initially found was the red plate. And um, so I thought, well, that's great, but obviously there is more to it. So when I finally uh, found the black plate, I thought, all right, it's a two-color piece. I printed it. Yeah, there were parts missing, okay? So um, we finally found the yellow, printed it again, realized that there was still not enough there, and then finally, I think um, two years ago, found the blue so we can put together this composite piece. Um, and, you know, there you hope that um, the piece is intact, that it hasn't been uh, damaged or destroyed. And, in fact, you get a wonderful poster like the one on the right. Um, the problem there is that the wood is now so aged, so dried out, that um, I believe that that is the last printing of that particular poster. So we can um, obviously print those images, scan them, and then uh, reproduce them using Oh, like a magnesium raised block or something like that. I suppose you could do it in polymer, but, um, well, polymer is okay. Um, I just don't use it because I generally don't have to. Um, going back to the Globe collection, it was stored on a semi-trailer for 25 years. Six-foot pallets, meaning that they were putting hand-carved block face-to-face, -face and these things were, you know, what Chicago winters are like. The stuff froze and thawed for all of those years. Anyway, the, uh, the museum itself, um, this is where we were in the Hamilton factory. Uh, lest you think that we had the whole thing, we were really just on one side of the first floor. Um, uh, not a lot of people visiting the place in the beginning. To be honest, the Two Rivers Historical Society did not ever imagine there would be a group like this that would be interested in Hamilton. I think they saw it as a, something of a regional curiosity. But anyway, it was a wonderful place to be in. Obviously, from a historic standpoint, it was great. Um, and, you know, we wanted to keep that tradition. The place that we had inside was wonderful, um, though um, leaky at best. I think the place began to seriously fall apart in the 90s. Um, and the museum itself opened in 99. Um, and that was really my first year of connection with it. I began donating equipment that uh, my grandfather used at the family shop that I was running in Green Bay at the time. But anyway, um, it, was, it was time to move out. Um, having to suck water up every day to, to start your working day was not something I really liked to do. Um, so it was decided um, by, uh, by not really Hamilton, they didn't own the company anymore, it was a new owner, but anyway, we got our walking papers. So there were some things that we had to do before that, um, organize work crews, 
stand on the rooftop in front of the smokestack because of course it's your last chance. Um, but uh, rounding up volunteers. Lower right is a guy named Bob Miller. And uh, one of the great volunteers at Hamilton and also a former employee. The, the thing is, as great as the tools are, the pantograph or things like that, is obviously the individuals that operated them that really are the true value. But um, the point is that we, we needed to organize and sort and get the hell out of there in short order. Now, we were given free rent at Hamilton. so. That means we didn't really prepare for that day where we were going to have to um, actually buy a place and move on. So um, no money, um, really no personnel, and not really sure where we were going. Um, but uh, volunteers came forward. Um, contributors were incredible. And uh, we basically bought the only place in town that could fit us. So at this point, you're looking at um, well, you're looking at the museum, but the former Formright Tube Company was uh, our new location. And so over the course of, I think, um, 11 months, we packed everything up, moved 27 semis to our new location, and uh, began to set up. So uh, a, a bit of a task, but uh, like I said, volunteers came from across the country. So even in itself, I think the way the move went forward uh, was an incredible thing. Now at that time you had three employees. So I was the director, my brother Bill had been the uh, artistic director ever since I started. Um, he had put together a book on Hamilton's history back in 2004. So um, there was the two of us and then my assistant director, Stephanie Carpenter, um, an incredible help as well. But, you know, three people and 35,000 square feet of junk to move is a little daunting. Um, so obviously those volunteer crews were everything, really, really everything. So um, we've begun to put together the new museum and, and the idea of a working museum, as I said, means that the, the iron hand press in the foreground as well as that um, Chandler and Price in the background need to be working machines so that we can use them um, to, uh, you know, to illustrate the way, basically. Um, one of the great things about the new place is that we, um, we have gallery space. And whether we're celebrating Firecracker Press out of St. Louis um, on the top, or uh, Tom Walker, a wonderful printer from Indianapolis down below, it's great to be able to illustrate what is happening in American letterpress, new or old. Um, currently, we've got an incredible exhibit um, with an opening tomorrow night of uh, Russian Civil War posters, so 1917 to 1924, um, and uh, not surprisingly, the collection is owned by someone from Chicago. Um, so um, it helps knowing people in uh, in high places. Sorry for the pun, but I, uh, you know. Um, John Downer, uh, an incredible sign painter from Iowa, came forward and said, if I let him paint the sign, he would charge me only for materials. And uh, as, as you um, travel up the lake shore, you get to see that beautiful sign to let you know where we are, basically. Um, going way too fast all of a sudden. Um, contemporary type, we have always, um, wanted to get the pantographs working to the extent that they became uh, something that would allow us to actually get back into the process to the point where we could make a lot of type. And you're looking at Norm Brilsky, um, sort of uh, our, our godfather. Um, he was that guy who um, retired from Hamilton and cut type at the museum in that uh, demonstrative sort of way for visitors but really production was non-existent in the new museum. So um, Norb at that time was quite young, I think 85 or something like that. Um, so his daughter Georgie, standing next to him, comes up to me one day and says, what are you doing to preserve this? Dad's not going to be around forever. You have to begin teaching somebody new. You know, what are you, what are you going to do here? And um, you know, she was right. Every time Norb came in, I dropped whatever I was doing and I would listen and take notes, but um, it's just me. That was not good enough. Someday, 
I will qualify as a really bad type cutter. I, I can promise you that. But um, anyway, she was standing there with her daughter. So I, I basically threw it back in her face and I said, I see second and third generation type cutters right here. Why don't you learn from your dad? Um, partly because I didn't have time and partly because as a third generation printer myself, I love the idea that um, she could learn from her father and she has uh, taken me up on that and uh, we are in the middle currently of a, a process of having not nor because he's at 91 doesn't stand for eight hours like he used to so instead uh, she is learning from Mardell Dubeck my apologies for Mardell for not showing more of her right here I wanted to illustrate the pantograph as well but um, Mardell is the best type cutter in the world um, she uh, retired from Hamilton, but needing a paying job, she wasn't going to volunteer at the museum, okay? Um, now, when I say she is the world's best typecutter, you know she doesn't have a lot of competition, so that's more easily said. Um, but in any case, uh, to have her come back into the museum and teach is an incredible thing. Um, Dave Arts, uh, a type trimmer, again, uh, I think Dave still has a job, but at least we pull him in when we need to as a way of, uh, you know, continuing that process to work on those new projects that come to us. This particular face is named after Dave Arts. Um, we would have named it after Mardell, but the designer of this type, uh, of this font, Eric Speakerman, um, only likes four letter words for his type. So. Mardell being too long, we named it Arts instead. Uh, but a great project for us. Obviously, getting to work with Eric Speakerman is a wonderful thing. Um, another member of our artistic board is a wonderful and incredibly talented guy by the name of Nick Sherman, who I believe is at Funk Bureau right now. Um, Nick decided to design a typeface to honor Norb, um, which we will call uh, Brilsky Bold, but uh, you're looking at the pattern making process because you need patterns for every single character, figure, punctuation, etc. So um, Norb taught Nick how to make patterns from his type. And uh, more in use, it looks like this. When we had an opportunity Boy, it's been 10 years ago now to work with Matthew Carter. Of course, again, you're going to jump on something like that. Um, though Matthew had uh, this Latin style that he wanted cut in a chromatic. Um, it might have been easy for William Page 100 years ago. Hamilton was not quite equipped. So while we cut the majority of it at the museum, we also had a little bit of an assist here with uh, Denver Hall CNC in St. Paul. So you get to see positive and negative here. Uh, registration being a relatively difficult thing in a chromatic font. Now, while we are always attempting to illustrate and record the older methods, it's obvious that you also need to uh, move on to the other side of the fence and consider the future. So from a digital standpoint, we partnered with Rich Kegler of P22 in Buffalo, New York. And so Rich has now, I believe, digitized about 15 of our fonts in addition to things like catchwords and uh, certainly those types that have been coming to us, uh, like the uh, uh, Matthew Carter's Van Lannen Latin and, uh, and the arts. Um, one other project we were very proud of is the uh, Le Chute Seed font here. Um, if that looks like uh, a font you are not familiar with, it's because uh, this is the language of the Tulalip tribes in Washington State. Being in danger of essentially losing their language, being down to four speakers, the tribe makes what I consider a brilliant decision to teach the young members of the tribe their language via letterpress. Um, the, the idea here is that the manipulation of tools creates a longer sense of retention. So every summer now on the reservation they have language camp and so these children are just thrilled to be able to set their name and type and print it. It's a, a wonderful process that, you know, why would you not want to be a part of this? When you look at this type though, it, it created certain problems and you probably can't see all of the difficulties with it, but um, uh, Le Chute Seed has often multiple diacriticals as well as characters 
with no standard X height. So you can't even use standard software um, to, to work on the type. That credit goes to Julia Chen of Seattle who uh, designed uh, that font for them. This, this is not uh, a font that looks good in Times New Roman, I can promise you. So we are uh, a working museum and uh, again the idea there is not only that we are printing with the entire collection but that we give the public that opportunity as well. Um, so initially you get to see Stephanie, the assistant director, uh, running one of the Vandercooks. And, you know, the, for us, uh, a great day is when we get to print. Um, our success means we are more often at the computer than at the press, and, well, we're trying to fix that. Um, but uh, when we are running workshops, they, they are of many natures, but generally speaking, if you go to our website, you'll see a number of public workshops. And uh, we also do a lot of school-based workshops. So I was just making arrangements for Kansas University to spend a week in July, I believe. Um, and then there are those people with basically no experience, with some experience, who are free to sign up. You don't need to know anything in advance. You don't need to even bring anything. Um, and, uh, and we'll teach you how to print. Um, when I was the only one at the museum, of course I wanted to print anything I could, but the thing that I wanted to print the most was uh, uh, over four foot tall number two just because I could, right? So um, uh, a woman, boy this is getting strange, a woman from Chicago said um, if, uh, if, if you ever want to print it I will help. So uh, this is us inking up uh, before we printed that big number two. Having no press that was six by four feet we had to do it by hand. So um, we, uh, we're trying to print a as much as we can in the collection. Uh, who you can't see here is Paul Brown of Indiana University, who has been coming up longer than I've been director uh, with students uh, and without, uh, one of whom is here today somewhere anyway. Um, but, um, you know, it's just great to print really big type like this simply because it's a lot of fun. Um, now Indiana will tell you that we're printing a big I. Uh, Norbrilski will tell you that's merely an H which stands for Hamilton. So I'll let them fight that out. Um, one of the ways that we attempt to bring people in is our ways goose. That is uh, an old English term that basically means a party for printers. And so we have run six of them uh, every November uh, for the last six years and really what we're doing is trying to get as many people in to the event as possible. Uh, last year this is about maybe 180 people who show up for uh, talks, workshops, and seminars by uh, a variety of people. So some of those are hands-on like a uh, letterpress workshop here by our board member and good friend Stacy Stern who used to teach at Columbia. Um, and then the uh, um, bookmaking workshops, um, you get to see John Downer sign painting um, and Matthew Carter discussing the evolution of letter forms. So we will run our conference again this November, I think it's the 6th, 7th and 8th, so sometime around July we'll open up registration for that. and. Uh, it should be pretty good. We're still assembling um, the speakers that, that we want to come in. Um, obviously, uh, a bit like uh, Creative Mornings when it's a, essentially a volunteer-based uh, operation, you know, you've got to kind of talk these people to come in um, simply because it's a good idea, right? Um, so Matthew uh, is one of those people who's been incredibly generous. Jim Sheradden had show prints. Uh, another wonderful person who's come in, Sumner Stone, who used to design type for Adobe. Uh, again, Juliet Chen, who designed the Lachute seed. We've been incredibly fortunate there. Uh, if all holds up, um, our hope is that our, our main speaker this year is Marion Banches. So um, stay tuned and check the website for that. Um, so <coughs> within the collection, we are making prints from the blocks and the type that we've got. The Royal American Shows is actually full size. Asylum of Horrors is not. That's about six feet tall. 
Um, but it's wonderful stuff that I think reveals a lot about American history. So it's really um, a really great illustration of uh, the way we basically spoke to each other in the day. Um, I love the fact that it, uh, it says on stage and in person, Frankenstein the monster. Um, generally speaking, he doesn't show up to any of the venues I have ever gone to. Um, but um, I really would have loved to have seen that sort of stage production where, where you combine uh, film and, and uh, live images. So we were trying to do two things. These are basically as faithfully represented uh, as they would have been originally. And then there are those times that we play around with the type a little bit more. Um, on the uh, left is sort of the way uh, my brother Bill puts a take on his type. Um, uh, playing both with the imagery and obviously layout, which um, is, is a lot of fun to do. As a commercial printer for so many years, I have something of a tough way of uh, breaking away from that commercial aspect. So top right is um, uh, one of my pieces, um, just sort of celebrating the freedom of the press. You know, one of those things that we have a tendency to overlook. Um, Anyway, um, we will play with that type in any way possible. When you have a rodeo block like that, you, you better use it. So I was putting together a poster. When I printed that piece, I thought, well, obviously, I need to put the word rodeo at the top. Um, it didn't really seem finished, so I put it again at the bottom. And I thought, yeah, rodeo, rodeo. And obviously, the tagline is just my own bad sense of humor. <laughs> Um, our uh, sort of pinup girl, um, a lower left, but an educational one, right? Because, you know, we, we're, we're illustrating bulletin typeface at the same time. Um, even the auto races, those two blocks were not intended together, but obviously why, why wouldn't you? So um, I've brought a number, well, not of these posters, but just of, of ones in the collection, which you are free to come up and look at uh, after the talk. Um, to be honest, you, you could even buy them if you like. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to move uh, into the idea of basically what we are doing these days. So um, I, I was basically transfixed at that machine for the first uh, six, eight weeks of the year because we had an incredible project with Field Notes making uh, their latest edition uh, of books. And um, it, was, uh, it was quite a task. Uh, I'm standing in front of a Heidelberg windmill letterpress, and um, I, I seriously felt like I lived there because um, in letterpress, obviously, really high volume of uh, production is, is not always the case, at least compared to, say, Offset or Web. But this was a 75,000 impression run, and then I believe it, it was closer to 85,000 when we were done. So between Aaron Draplin of Field Notes um, and uh, their wonderful people, they laid out, I think, seven different uh, covers uh, which we kind of put together and uh, varied it with this great French paper. So uh, seven layouts, three colors of ink, four papers, um, a lot of nights, a lot of weekends, but um, the result was this sort of stunning thing, and obviously this is great for Hamilton. Um, to be associated with field notes, you just have to give credit to Aaron Draplin and, and certainly Jim Kudal for uh, wanting to do a project with us. So very grateful to those guys, but um, it's, uh, it's sort of the direction that we want to take things in. Not that I want to do another 75,000 run, at least for a couple of months, but um, that uh, the idea that the Working Museum begins to produce printing as well. We will always be producing posters and specimen sheets, but uh, moving forward in, in whatever way we can, both to illustrate and, and to bring uh, people to the museum, whether you are coming for a tour um, or a studio rental. Um, summers, we often have uh, those that can get away, generally that means uh, faculty spending sometimes two to three weeks working. Um, before I began, Kim was saying it would be great to get the Creative Mornings group up there for a workshop. That could be. You know, you get, um, I think, anywhere more than six people and um, you can give us a call and set up your own workshop. And 
Uh, certainly we do that as often as absolutely possible. So um, despite our, our Luddite um, uh, leanings, you can obviously get a hold of us in many ways. Um, uh, again, like she had said earlier, um, we are uh, on Twitter, on Facebook. We have a website, of course, and Instagram. Um, I will probably not be the person responding to any Twitters. I'm, I am technologically challenged, I, I have to admit that. So um, again, um, uh, most appreciative for uh, you guys coming out and listening today. Thank you very, very much. values uh, are you trying to compensate uh, like it's sort of replicating the uh, type but is there a, the depth of the carving is that something you're doing by hand or is it all like set up with the machine um, it, it is all set up pretty much with the machine and so so that depth is pretty much uniform we're we're so fortunate that uh, Hamilton did not discard all of the patterns they didn't necessarily care for a lot of them very well but because the patterns are intact in a lot of ways, um, we have that ability to simply go with that. But it's still a great question because as we try to teach from one person to another, there, there's a lot of dust and rust to be shaken off. Mardell, as I said, is a great type cutter, but on the other hand, she stopped working for HWT in 92 and then, you know, 15 years passed before we bring her back in. Um, and then you've got uh, individuals with special needs. Um, Eric Speakerman being one of them, uh, kind of putting us through our paces. We are grateful for that, but, but it does demand that we, we rethink it. But essentially, our attempt is to duplicate uh, it as exactly as it was. I, I actually have a question. Go um, ahead, Kim. Do you guys yeah. do any do you do any commission work? Like if, if I mm. designed a typeface, could I commission you to make it with what type? Yes, what, what Kim had asked is if we did commissioned work. And so whether that would uh, be anything from uh, posters to making a typeface, yeah, absolutely. So what, what we uh, would like to get all the way into is helping out those people who have mostly a set of type where you could cut replacement letters. I know Hatch Showprint down in Nashville would love to have us do lots of replacement work for them. Um, but at this point, it would be so expensive. Um, so if you're uh, commissioning an entire font, um, that works very well. Um, if you're asking us to do wedding invitations, I don't think we can do that yet. Uh, wood type tends to be a little too big for that application. <laughs> Hi, oh. and thanks so much for coming today. You mentioned French paper, and I wondered, have the, has the paper industry been supportive of you guys? Um, okay. The paper industry has been incredible. Um, I, I uh, appreciate you asking because um, uh, French obviously helped out with the field notes job. My introduction to French um, goes back to when I had the shop in Green Bay and occasionally the distributor would drop off French swatch books and I didn't know anything about them. I assumed they were from France. That's, <laughs> that's how much I know. And anyway, but our first Waze Goose, I thought we could use a little bit extra paper, so I called them up and I said, would you mind contributing a small amount to us? So I think four cartons of cut size and two full cartons of Parent sheets came from French. Appleton Coated um, in Wisconsin um, had been a paper sponsor of ours, giving us a lot. Mohawk has been really wonderful. So, um, you know, as it turns out, a small amount of paper for them is a large amount for us. So we have been incredibly fortunate that way. So it, it helps a lot. Uh, could you put the slide before this back up? Because everyone is trying to shoot a picture of that. <laughs> could you not? Thank you. Um, so thank you. 
you know, the average age here is 28 and a half. And they all grew up on Max. Why, why are we all so in love with this? I have, I have theories, but not facts. Um, I think that, there, that it's a number of things, and um, there's obviously something of a kind of a, a retro uh, feel to it, and certainly a, a do-it-yourself thing, but in, in a sense, the, the computer has been an incredible thing for us. Obviously, anyone who sells stuff online is very appreciative uh, of the digital uh, world and the internet, but I, I, to some extent, I think that it is a reaction to where we often find ourselves, which is glued to a uh, computer that doesn't really let you reach in and touch anything at all. And wood has this wonderfully warm feel to it, a, a very physical object. You can pick it up and you can turn it around. Um, and there, as, as great as the computer is, I think we all very much need to get off of the computer and begin working with our hands because they're, they're so well designed for that. Um, so I think that it, it's something of a realization that handling these things is a, a really nice um, uh, release and, uh, and opposite of uh, working on the screen. Um, that idea that, that you physically move the tools uh, is, is something that is maybe the result from, from keyboarding from age five onward. You know, you find yourself in a cubicle uh, working at a computer all day, and I know that sounds like a lot of fun, but um, uh, I, I am thrilled that, that I get to work in, in a place where uh, there's a lot of physical activity as well, and I think people just respond to that fact that um, there, there is that beauty of type that never, never disappears, right? You know, we look at these typefaces and they speak to us in a great way because we use them to communicate and we are never going to stop communicating. So this idea that, that we get to use this uh, old method of basically saying the same thing, you know, I think the, the metaphor that, that comes to my mind is that the, the great thing about type is it's like picking up an old guitar and playing a new song. So you have this ability to take the, that, old, um, that old tool and, and make it say something new. Um, good morning. Um, I'm just interested in how uh, these, the, the old types, um, how well they work with like modern inks. Um, and you know whether there's a, an interesting like juxtaposition using um, a really fun old technology and then taking something new like a conductive ink or something like that and applying them to bring two worlds together. You know. Mm -hmm. it, it, um, we're very fortunate that you don't need to mix a recipe of letterpress ink up every time you want to run something. So a uh, brand new offset ink works ideally for us. But it, it is kind of nice that we get to work uh, in conjunction with newer and older methods, whether you are laying down a, a letterpress image and then coming over the top with um, digital work um, or, or collaging it in a number of ways that um, a, a certain amount of the work is done on the computer and then finished on letterpress. We try to combine it as many ways as possible. There are, uh, there are people who design and make type, sort of like Jackson, and realize that um, if you want to make acrylic type on a CNC and use it, obviously um, there's, there's wonderful ways of merging technologies. And you know, there's always going to be those people who are offended by the fact that you aren't doing everything traditionally. But on the other hand, you, you only need to go back to Hamilton, who obviously understood that when that wonderful new tool came along, you didn't say, oh no, we'd rather do it the slow way. I, you, you merely embrace it and utilize it uh, in that wonderful way to kind of make it harmonize with the rest. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, I'm, I'm a fabric artist, and I want to go into graphic making patterns. And I was wondering, like, I saw your, the different illustrations. Could that be printed on fabric? Yes. 
Um, so we've experimented a lot with it just because, you know, you see one of those great images like that, that wonderful clown there and you want to put it on a shirt or something like that. Um, at least that, I guess that's where my head has a tendency to go. Um, but um, a wonderful thing happened the, the uh, first summer I was at the museum where a woman came out from Maine and uh, she was a fabric artist and she, um, she basically made aprons. So she set type in the shape of aprons, I think about four feet high. Now, um, you can use the ink that we use. You can't use screen printing ink because it's essentially too watery. But um, you certainly can print on fabric. You know, you simply have to make sure that it's very smooth because the type can be damaged. For the same reason, uh, handmade paper is an incredible thing, but if you have pulp solids, then you can damage both uh, press and type. But many fabrics will work really well. It's just if they are wearable things, it probably isn't going to last quite as long. But uh, last summer, I had to uh, go out to New York City for AIGA's 100th anniversary, and they asked us to do uh, a variety of things, but we printed a 12-foot uh, piece of linen, I believe, in multiple colors. It, it was a pain in the ass, I have to <laughs> tell you, but um, anyway, it worked really well. So, um, you know, why not? Until someone convinces me it can't be done, of course. All right, thank you. All right, thank you.